Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast. And I hope this next episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel. That way you'll never miss a thing. So pastors, I know how difficult it can be to keep your sermons feeling fresh and relevant, especially when you're preaching week after week. So whether you're hitting a writer's block or you're in a rush because it's Friday and you're trying to put the finishing touches on your sermon, things don't always go as planned. So to help you, I've created a 10-step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I've simplified the whole process of preparation into a series of steps and reminders that can help me and you ensure that our sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable. Super easy to use, 10 simple prompts with examples, and you can start using it as early as this Sunday. So just go to preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description. You'll get a copy sent to you for free today. Today's episode is also brought to you by Compassion. Words are powerful, but as a communicator, it's far too easy to underestimate the impact of experiences. So when people experience God in a way that is outside their usual rhythms and routines, lives change. That's why I encourage you to bring a compassion experience to your church. It's an interactive way to witness the realities of life for children in poverty and the church's incredible response. Families in your community will see how the gospel is transforming lives around the world. And because not everybody can go on a mission trip, you can bring the experience to you. Compassion is currently working with the local church to release over 2.2 million children from poverty in Jesus' name. And I have personally supported them for years. To learn more, go to compassion.com slash carry. And now to today's episode. Well, it's a delight to have you both on the podcast today. Welcome, Richard. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be with you. Well, I've been excited for this for a number of months, and I'd love for you to talk about, just so that we can frame it for our listeners, how the two of you got to know each other and work together and how you got connected on this project, your latest book on humility. Uh, Brenda and I known each other over a long period of time, but uh, more recently, I was dreaming about this uh, a little book project, and I asked Brenda and a few others just to read what I was writing and make comments. And Brenda was just, Brenda's a pastor in the uh, Denver area, and uh, I just felt that those comments were so helpful. And uh, and then when this idea of these podcasts, you know, in the old, de- old days, I would, you know, jump on horseback and go around and <laughs> see people. <laughs> but, uh, but now we have uh, this wonderful technology, and I asked Brenda to help me out because, you know, I don't never know if I can get three sentences together. So, uh Brenda was so kind. I mean, she's a full-time <laughs> pastor and works hard, and but has been willing to do these podcasts. So, Brenda, maybe you have. And a- I will say he hasn't really. Richard hasn't really needed me, but it's been a good partnership because we both live in different worlds and just come from different perspectives because of the ways we spend our days. So it's just been nice to join in the conversation. Well, it's going to be great to have it with both of you. I wanted people to hear the pastoral perspective that Brenda has. I mean, she's working with hundreds of folks all of the time. I'm sitting here at my desk, you know, (laughs) answering an email or two. So uh, she gives a perspective that is very helpful. (laughs) Well, Richard, you're best known for your work on spiritual disciplines. And I'd like to ask both of you, because that was what Celebration of Discipline, Celebration of Discipline goes back to what? Was it 1978? Yep. I got the year right? Yeah. Wow. Wow. So that's, uh, let me do some quick math, 35 years. No. My goodness. 40 some. 45. 45 years. Yeah. Yeah. Again, if, if math was my future, there would be no future. <laughs> 45 years. My goodness. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a legacy. How have, maybe you can outline the disciplines. I'm, I know it's sold millions of copies. So many people have read it. It's a classic. But some of the disciplines that have sustained both of you over your life. Uh, there's so many. Uh, uh, of course, an attentiveness to Scripture, uh, allowing it to read me has been so helpful. And also, solitude, times. I mean, the first little church I pastored, it would rank as a marginal failure on the ecclesiastical scoreboards. But <laughs> I went to the elders and said, you know, I need to learn more about God. And they readily agreed. And so we arranged uh, four times a year, just following the seasons in the fall, in the winter, in the spring, and in the summer that I would spend some time, usually it was just a good part of a week, and uh, then I would come back on Sunday and uh, lead the service, but not preach, so that during the time of solitude, I wasn't trying to prep a sermon. So uh, that was I was wonderful of those elders so many years ago. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, um, I think there are probably three disciplines that have been really formative amongst all of them. And I would say also for me, meditation on scripture has been a big one. Just just as a regular daily part of my life, um, it has formed me in really big ways. You know, I started that when I was in high school, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, and then solitude as well. However, I, I haven't had as much... Um, opportunity for long periods of solitude, like Richard described, where I would go away for a week. But, you know, I, I have had three sons and who are young adults now, but when they were growing up, it, I, I had to find that solitude. And every day I had to find little pockets of solitude. And I read Richard's book when I, you know, before I was married, before I had kids. And I really took to heart that discipline of solitude. And and felt like it needed to be a regular part of my life where I could listen to God and and just quiet down my life to hear Him. And so I really tried to incorporate that in small ways um, daily, on a daily basis, and it really has made a huge difference for me. And then I'll just throw in a third one. I think um, the discipline of simplicity has been a big one for me to focus on. And Richard has a great book on simplicity. And um, in the world that we live in, the culture that we live in, um, it's pretty countercultural to be, you know, committed to simplicity, and it's challenging. But that one has been big for me too. Richard, I'd love to drill down a little bit when you would take that time off when you were pastoring, because we have a lot of church leaders listening. What would solitude look like for you? Very simple. Uh, I would take my Bible and a journal to write in. And that was it. Wow. I didn't take books to read or any of those kinds of things except Scripture itself. And what helped me a great deal was I was able to read uh, large passages of Scripture and stay with them. I remember, I think it was one of the very earliest retreat times, was uh, to read through the book of Jeremiah weeping prophet. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, uh, yeah. in those days, I really identified with Jeremiah. <laughs> There's one passage where uh, <laughs> where they took Jeremiah and threw him down a well. They were trying to break his neck, but mm -hmm. he, it didn't happen. There was a bunch of mud at the bottom of the well. Anyway, the I, I can't remember what version I was reading, but I remember the passage where it said that Jeremiah sank in the mire. And boy, I thought, that's me. <laughs> I'm in the mire. <laughs> so that was a great help to me. And uh, I would go to, a, it was a little Catholic uh, retreat house, their retreat. And uh, so I would, uh, oh, at the meal times talk with the priest. There were usually was, I think, only one, maybe a couple. But just ask questions and learn more about their life. And uh, that was it. Then I'd come back, oh, I don't know, Thursday, Friday. And, uh, of course, I'm prepping for a Sunday. I mean, in a pastoral context, that's sort of, you know, you go 
from Sunday to Sunday. And, uh, but also to have a sense of where people are so that this is the kind of reflection or response out of um, the retreat time. I would uh, go and sit where the people sat, my people. Now, uh, most congregations are probably similar. People would tend to sit in the same places. So I would sit there um, trying to soak in what are they dealing with? What are the pains, the hurts? And, uh, and that was just a very simple prayer time for them as I would prepare for Sunday. Somebody else would do the preaching, but, but you know, when you are leading a worship service, Brenda knows this, uh, you are trying to be baptized into the sense of the meeting. What's happening here? Uh, what do people need? Uh, you know, I uh, can't remember his name, who said that everybody is sitting beside their own pool of tears. And uh, so and that would lead up to Sunday. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that. I had the privilege of interviewing Eugene Peterson before he yeah. passed away a few years ago. And just a, just a gem. And also interviewed his son and his biographer more recently. And, you know, you said something, I just, maybe there's nothing there, Richard, and I'd like both of your takes on it, because Brenda, you're a pastor, you lead, uh, you know, a church today, etc. But you said, you know, I'm not, you just threw it off to the side. You said, I'm not sure my church would have been considered to be a success in, <laughs> in the measure of the world. I wonder if there is sometimes a tension between practicing the disciplines, practicing the way of Jesus, and what we might call success in the eyes of the world. And I think about Eugene Peterson because I think he felt that tension as well. I'd love your comment on that uh, from both of you, from your perspective. You go ahead, Brenda. Well, yes. I, you know, I think our, our world looks at numbers, and I think that's probably one of the things Richard's talking about. It was his, mm -hmm. he was at a small church and Mm -hmm. Um, we, we talk about that a lot, um, at my church, you know, it's, it's not really about numbers. It's about following Jesus. And I think, um, in the eyes of the world, often it's, um, pleasing people and are, are we there to please people or are we there to, to please God and to, to follow Jesus and what he has, um, for us as leaders, you know, and, and there, there can be a big difference. You know, we want to serve mm -hmm. people for sure. But um, it's it's really not about pleasing people. It's about keeping our eyes on Jesus and um, leading the church in the ways that He guides us every day on a daily, you know, daily basis to serve our people. Hmm. Well, one of the things that happened in that little church, I mean, uh, learning how to work together. See, <laughs> I remember <laughs> in those days. The conservatives, they were mad at the liberals. And the liberals, they were mad at the radicals. And the radicals, God bless them, they were just mad. <laughs> I mean, I think half my congregation had the gift of discouragement. I just, oh, I mean, it was so dysfunctional. But then, as we began to work and learn and grow, and uh, I mean, I early on uh, felt that uh, I needed to understand and experience life with God in a deeper way, which led me to the great devotional masters. I knew that they had a sense of God in a way that I didn't know, and I need to learn. So it didn't matter really what book, you know, I get uh, Teresa of Avila's Interior Castle or or Brother Lawrence's, The Practice of the Presence of God, whatever, and slowly, slowly, slowly learn to grow in grace. And uh, and that was a wonderful thing among the people. I mean, we had a, 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 a this was way back in the, what, the 70s. Uh, there was so dis much dysfunction. 
and uh, and we could see people begin to get healed up and wonderful things happen, a little influx of folks. And uh, uh, now it wasn't always perfect. We had some real tragedies too, but uh, we learned together. See, that was it, that uh, we didn't mm. learn not to fight with each other. Now, we, we had that center pole of, of uh, a Jesus alive and among us as our Savior to forgive us, our teacher to guide us, our Lord to rule us, our friend to come alongside us. And so we began to learn about life with God together with all of our differences and uh, so on. So that was kind of how it started in those days. Years later, of course, uh, I wrote Celebration, but we were working with all of those things through those early years. Hmm. Do you think there's an inherent tension between, quote, success numerically and keeping a strong interior life? Is it mutually exclusive or is it just especially difficult? <laughs> especially difficult. Um, <laughs> we, we, wonderful things can happen in there, churches that thrive. And I knew Eugene Peterson pretty well and his congregation yeah. back east. And, and, uh, but he kept his focus on Jesus. Yeah. And, and, uh, a, a, a sense he had a, or has a book, there's a book, The Contemplative Pastor. And, uh, right. uh, one of the old writers, George Fox, would often talk about taking people off of himself and turning them to Jesus, their present teacher. And I thought, oh, yes, see. If I can learn in that direction. Now, see, I also pastored what the church growth analysts would call a large church. And it was a kind of place where things seemed to go right no matter what I did. <laughs> I, could <laughs> enter, I could enter the pulpit thinking I was in this, lived in the slew of despond, come out feeling like I lived on Mount Sinai. I mean, just carried by the life of, uh, of a congregation, wonderful people. And so it isn't, it isn't uh, the size that hardly matters at all. See, the great danger in churches is the ABCs, attendance, buildings, and cash. And if you, folk mm -hmm. your, if you focus your attention there, you've lost. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. We focus our attention on a life, a life, with God, the healing up of uh, so many of the deep needs that people have and the learning to grow day by day. I mean, that lovely passage in First Peter where he says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's so wonderful, but, but many people can make no sense of it because they think of grace only as unmerited favor. And it is that. But you don't grow in unmerited favor. See, we're not just saved by grace. We live by grace. Many of your listeners here are in all kinds of settings, maybe into businesses or other situations outside of church life. I mean, most people spend the large portion of their time in some office or business or, uh, you know, relational thing with people. And we've got to learn. It's That's where the life really comes. How can I live with God there? And, uh, you know, with uh, bosses that are, <laughs> uh, well, you know. <laughs> and, I think I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we learn. We learn slowly. And we do. We learn in community. We learn from each other how we grow in grace. Uh, so, I mean, the Christian consumes grace like a 747 consumes fuel on takeoff. We need to learn that all of life is done under the grace of God. Does that make sense? 
It certainly does. Mm -hmm. Brenda, I mean, you're in the trenches every day in pastoral ministry. Uh, What are your thoughts about the endemic tension between, you know, growth and uh, staying spiritually true or anchored or rooted? Because, I mean, the headlines are just filled with examples of where that that all went horribly wrong. How are you experiencing that? Do you think it's especially difficult or do you think it's mutually exclusive? What, what is your thought? Well, I, I really think that much of the tension lies in just the time factor, our time. We only have so much time every day mm-hmm. and there are always so many people and um, needs that are pulling at us. You know, as, as a pastor, as, you know, as a leader of a business, whatever you might be doing, um, we have to make choices about how we spend our time. And so often it's, it becomes very easy for that time with God to be squeezed out, for that time in the Word, for that time sitting in the quiet where we can hear God's voice, where we're maybe not doing a Bible study or preparing a sermon or preparing a business plan or whatever it might be, but we're just, we're just sitting and having downtime where we can hear God's voice, um, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak. We, we can't, we can't hear the Holy Spirit if, if we don't have some quiet. You know, that's where we, we talk about solitude. We need that, um, in a daily way in our lives. And I, what I love about Eugene Peterson, what I love about Richard is they really made conscious daily choices to take that time with God and, and to spend those longer periods with God. You know, Eugene got up every morning and he sat in the Psalms every morning and sat in prayer for not just 10 minutes, but, you know, for good periods of time early every morning and even, even into the morning. Um, and he, you know, he had a church with a lot of needs. He led groups of leaders at his church. And yet that was always a priority that didn't change for him. You know, I think about Richard. I was just reading some notes the other day of a talk Richard gave about how he had chosen to step out of public speaking, out of public ministry a few years ago. And he just felt that clear call of God. And he, he explained why. And you might want to talk more about that, Richard, but mm-hmm. that's not something many leaders today make a choice to do, to, to ste- step out of the public eye, um, step out of, um, you know, public speaking and opportunities to, to be out there using your voice. And yet um, it was something Richard chose to do, and that's how this book came about, partly. Well, well, let's go there. Thank you for that, Brenda. <laughs> Why did you make that choice? Tell us about it. Well, there... There's a whole bunch of factors, but let me tell you the a key one. Uh, now, my associate uh, would set out, we did this once a year, set out all speaking engagements. Now, at that time, I was, te- I was a professor at a university, but I would do this public speaking. And uh, she would set all of this out. We had a little clearness committee to help us Think about that, what we should say yes to, what we should say no to. And the first question that we always ask is, what do I need? Where's the situation with me? What about the family? And my wife, Carolyn, was part of that clearness committee. And at that particular time, she said, uh, our kids were just entering the teen years. And she said, uh, you know... Richard, you kind of, you need to make a decision. Do you want to be better known and have a mess at home? Or do you want to be less well known and have a good situation at home? And I said, Oh, that's the word of the Lord. We're going to say we had about 300 invitations up there. I said, we'll say no to all of them. And, uh, it was the shortest meeting we ever had. <laughs> and wow. Uh, as it was that period, uh, I didn't know if I would ever write or speak again. As it turned out, that period lasted about 18 months. And out of it was came the vision for uh, uh, working together, a community that could uh, find ways of working together. And we formed this little ragtag group, Renovari, And that's a Latin word that means to give new life. And, uh, and we just had, uh, we just had a conference at Brenda's church. And let me say, uh, one of the reasons we were at that congregation or in in that church was I could see the influence that Brenda has had over the years 
to form a community. And anyway, we did a little conference there. We Then we took our ministry team for a week, uh, our own personal retreat as a team, because we're a, we're a dispersed community all over the country. And so we come together once a year for retreat among ourselves. And uh, it was a wonderful time. See, that's um, mm-hmm. We don't do this stuff on our own. We learn to grow together. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's categorical decision-making at its best. You turned 300 decisions into one decision for 18 <laughs> months, and it was just a blanket <laughs> no. And uh, that's fantastic. And out of that, that's this is what's really surprising. I did not know that that is what gave birth to Renovare, which obviously has had uh, huge implications, global implications. Brenda, you know, as somebody who's still in active day-to-day ministry, do you sense, because you, I, I sense like me, have a pre-digital memory, has it gotten more complicated to say no because of all the inbound? And if so, do you have any tips, recommendations, strategies for safeguarding your soul, your personal time, and all of those things, because the demands in leadership, in ministry in particular, seem to have just been rising, not falling. Yeah, I I think, um, you know, as as I talked about before, having that time with God and His Word really regularly Mm -hmm. and in prayer, um, and that just that quiet time for listening to Him, but I think it's also, I may, I really make a practice of asking the hard questions in my life and really trying to look underneath, underneath what's happening in the church, underneath what our motivations are as leaders, um, what the messages from our culture are versus God's messages um, through His Word, through His Spirit. And I think some of us are probably more... Uh, naturally um, prone to asking the hard questions than others. It's some of it's a personality thing, but I think it's also a um, really a rhythm that we need to get into um, as leaders. We, we have to ask the hard questions. Why would I say yes to such and such, you know, this invitation or this new commitment? Um, what, what will it mean in my life if I say yes uh, what are my motivations for saying yes? Is it are these um, fleshly motivations, or are, are they motivations that are focused on Jesus and on His kingdom? Um, what? How will my life change if, if I make this decision? You know, asking those hard questions. How will my ministry change? How will my mm. church change? How? Uh, how will this affect my business? Um, how will this affect my ability to serve those around me? How? How will this? affect my margin in my life? You know, will I, mm-hmm. will I have margin? Will it take away my margin to be able to, um, have, take interruptions and, and help those that I wasn't planning on helping or serving that day? I think all of those hard questions are ones that we have to ask and be, uh, you know, just in a habit of living with and, and then living with the, the answers that we get as we ask those questions. I think you're getting into the really hard stuff now, and I appreciate the hard question framing. Were you nervous about, like, there's a FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. So when you say no, and I think those are great questions to ask, like, like, oh, maybe I have to reconsider some of my yeses over the last little while in light of all those hard questions. But like, you know, I, I guess I guess what I was saying is, do you fear when you cancel out 300 at a time or just say, okay, I'm just not going to do that? What do you do with the fear of missing out? Let Either. me just tie in to what Brenda said. It's so, sh- yeah, so right helpful too. because every yeah. yes has a no tied to it. And we mm-hmm. have to really learn that lesson. When I say yes, I've learned I'm I'm also saying no to certain things. And uh and because uh we uh are finite human beings. I mean one of the things that solitude does for us is teach us that we are not the CEO of the universe. Mm. And uh that's a hard lesson for us. Now, the freedom See, in the early days, uh, 
I was not a type A person. I was a triple A. I mean, you know, I'm going to conquer the world at least by tomorrow. And uh, I had to learn, see, that I'm not in charge of all of this. And sure, you think, oh, I'll miss the great opportunity of life. <laughs> if it's right for me to be, uh, well, look, I remember way, way back, I had decided that Friday night I was going to spend with the family, the kids. They were just growing up. and. Uh, it, just after that, a big executive called and asked if I would come and speak at such and such a place. And I said, oh, no, I can't. And uh, he said, uh, oh, do you? I mean, it was a Friday night. That was the time with the kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, oh, do you have another commitment? I didn't know back then that I could say, yes, I certainly do. <laughs> I just said, no, I mean, and then I could just feel the condemnation coming over the phone line. <laughs> and I sort of felt like I made myself look less to this person. When I hung up the phone, I just jumped up and said, hallelujah. I've learned to say no. To, you know, whatever. Uh, because I was saying yes to Carolyn and the kids for that night. <laughs> That's how we mm -hmm. learn, slowly, slowly. And, and that it's okay. It's okay. We cannot accomplish everything in the world, and we're not asked to. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to learn. We are not the CEO of the universe. <laughs> And, you know, one of the things I, I've learned from Richard also that I've really appreciated along with that is we also don't have to be so worried about what other people think when we make these decisions. Because mm -hmm. I think we just, we mm -hmm. want people to think well of us and they want, we want them to know that we, we're servants and that we're good at what we do and we're good leaders. And it, it can be really hard to just try and manage everyone's perceptions of us all the time. And Richard has really taught me that we can leave that in God's hands. We can, of course, we're going to, we're going to love people. We're going to always be loving, but we, we can leave our reputations and what other people perceive of us in God's hands and it'll be okay. That's a really good word. See, if we give, if we give a proper perspective in life, then we can be present with people when we are with them. If we're full of muchness, manyness, then when we're with people, we're scattered, uh, we're fractured, we're fragmented. We can't actually sit with another person and listen, listen to the heartache, listen to the hurt, listen to the needs, or laugh together, whatever, see? So we need to have a sort of balance. We're, we're we're not infinite. We're finite human beings, and there's a limit. And as I'm aging here, as you can tell, uh, my limitations are greater, and I need to learn that I can't, uh, I can't do everything these days. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> Richard, I, I have to ask on behalf of a lot of listeners and perhaps myself, how does one go from being a type A or triple A, in your words, <laughs> to living a contemplative life. Because, you know, when you're looking at your new book, uh, Learning Humility, I mean, there's a, this is not a type A pace that you're living and haven't lived for decades. What was that transition like? My goodness. Very painful <laughs> and very <laughs> slow. <laughs> yeah. I, and... These little times of solitude were a great help. Another great help, and it's a wonderful spiritual discipline, is silence. That I don't have to always speak up and straighten everybody out on whatever it is. You know, I can just listen to another human being and, uh, and just be still with them. Isn't that wonderful? I was just with my son uh, the other day, and we were hiking, 
and sometimes you visit a little bit, but we had a period, and we've done this many years, so we know, where we hiked in complete silence, complete, I mean, we didn't speak about the politics or the or whatever, and we listened to the earth, to the birds, to the little God's friends, you know. And uh, one of the reasons we love to go into the woods there is because uh, these creatures, the trees, they're doing the will of the Father. And I need to learn to do that too. Remember how that Jesus said, uh, what, what was it that we should be uh, harmless, innocent as doves and wise as the serpent? Now, I just, I could get the dove part, sure, sure. I could never get the serpent part until where I hike, there are a number of rattlesnakes. <laughs> you know what? The serpent can wait and wait until the time's right. And uh, so I need to learn that, learn to wait and not always jump in. Not, uh, you know, in the early pastoral, Brenda may know about this experience where I try to save it, uh, you know, to rescue everybody. <laughs> There's a decision, that uh, an area, a problem that they're going through. And I want to rush in and rescue them. No, you have to. You have to leave people alone for a while, willing to be there, be with them, pick up the pieces when things fall apart, and uh, but not to rush in and try to control everything. And uh, that's a great discipline for us to learn with each other. Give people freedom. Yeah. <laughs> Solitude and silence are becoming more and more attractive to me, not just as disciplines, but as lifestyle as I yeah. get older. And we're fortunate to live in the country. You both live in the Denver area. So you're surrounded by nature. I was just there. Uh, we have a little backyard, a lake across the road. And mm -hmm. I was having a particularly bad day on Friday. You know, just one of those days where an A-type leader, you're like not going the way I want it to. And I did hear the words of Jesus in my, my mind, like, look at the birds. And we have a ton of birds in our yard. And look at the flowers. And my wife has beautiful gardens. And I'm like, yeah, they're living to the glory of God. We have flowers on our property nobody, no human will ever see. And that doesn't uh -huh. diminish their worth. And here's the question in this, which is, you know, we are surrounded by technology. We're communicating through screens and technology. But if you think about the scripture, it was always in an, you know, there was a city context, but the city was minutes, seconds from the country. And people were steeped in an agrarian life with a dependence on the land. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think the condition of our souls and our connection to nature are related? I'd love to hear from both of you on this. Mm -hmm. Brenda, you, you can start. Um. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the Bible starts off with God as creator. He created this world and, he, and the, it, you know, Genesis tells us day by day, step by step, how he created the world and how important this world is to him and all of, all of, the, all of the creation that he made and, and called it good. And so I think that um, as the last part of his creation, we human beings are, we have a tie in our soul to the creation. Um, and so when we're separated from that and we're not um we're not encountering God through nature I think we're we're probably not living as he created us to live and I, I love that about Richard's mm. book that he goes you know he weaves in and out of using quotes and using stories and talking about people and then talking about the hike he went on and talking about the flowers and talking about the birds that he saw and uh, you know, all the things that, that he saw um, outside or, or outside of his house, the trees, how important the trees are to him. And I love that because that's that's a, a really important place where we experience God. You know, Romans tells us that he reveals himself to us in nature. 
So if we're not finding ways, I, but I do think we can even find ways in the middle of a city. We can, we can be in parks. We can, uh, we can, we can sit out on the balcony of our apartment and enjoy the tree that's outside of our apartment building and the birds that are in the tree, or we can look up at the sky, whatever it is. There are ways that we can still find pieces of nature wherever we are. And, and I do think it's an important connection to God. You remember that the devotional masters told us to read two books, the Bible and the book of nature. And learning to do that, for me early on, it was just slipping out before bed for a few moments, just in silence looking at the stars. That simple action. Uh, Now, there is a kind of contradiction between the city and uh, nature. But the wonderful thing, uh, while Brenda was speaking, I, I turned to the wonderful book of Revelation and the 22nd chapter, because there the city and the rural, the country, the book of nature come together. The angel shows mm-hmm. to John a river, water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the streets of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And that's the bringing the urban and the country together. And that's what we're, we should see and look for, even today as we can. Uh, but certainly in the new heaven, the new earth, there's going to be um, a bringing together the city and the country. I hope in heaven, uh, you know, we're going to be growing and learning and having responsibilities. I'd, I'd like to uh, have... Uh, be given uh, some responsibilities over the national park system here in the states. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> that would be that would be great fun. That would be <laughs> fascinating, actually. Yeah, I think about that actually. You know, the responsibilities in heaven, and and the driven leader in me is like, oh, thank goodness, there's going to be work. At least you know, there's something to do in the morning that is redeemed and not as as perhaps t- tainted by the curse as we have on this side of eternity. Um, okay, humility. Why humility? Why this project? Because this is so important of all of the virtues. The great writers say that humility is the most basic, the most foundational for a growing uh, in the virtues. See, uh, think of think of the word teachability. Without yes. teachability, without us being teachable, it's very hard for us to move into anything, into any virtues. Um, we think we know everything. Well, see, that doesn't work very well. And it's it's that member humility comes from humus, the earth. Get us down to the earth. Yeah. And that's why it's so hmm. critical. But remember, this came to us through Jesus himself, his birth, his life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection. Humility is all through that. And uh, if we want to move into the likeness of Christ, humility is right at the foundation of it all. Brenda, what drew you in to be an early reader of this project and a regular reader of this project? Um, Well, I immediately resonated with just the topic of humility when Richard first wrote and said, I'm thinking of that God's maybe prompting me to start writing down some things about this subject. Um, I, you know, if for any of us, if, if we're followers of Jesus in this world, um, humility is not a topic that we encounter very often. 
um, mm-hmm. probably even in a not not even in a very direct way in the church all that often. Uh, we certainly encounter it a lot in scripture, but I don't know that we really talk about it a lot. And um, I think because we're all human beings who are very much immersed in in the culture that we live in, um, humility isn't the message that we're receiving from our culture very often. And so I think even for us who desire to be faithful to God and to His character and to what He's trying to form in us, we can very easily get drawn off track because of the messages that that we just live in all the time. Um, And if we're not careful to holding to Scripture, um, we can buy into a lot of those messages and we can start to follow where those messages take us and it can lead us away from God's will for us. So we, I, I think it's it's a message that's needed and Richard is the one to bring it. He's respected and I appreciate that he would take three years out of his life to slowly, slowly write this book and put it before several others and do edits and um, I really encourage everyone to get it because we all need it. We just, we, we need this reminder. Richard, you thought you had work to do on humility, right? That's how you open it. It's like, oh my, um, I haven't arrived. <laughs> well, it actually started, it was on a, a, a New Year's Eve. Uh, yeah, New Year's Eve. And I was I was thinking about New Year's resolution. Should I? Now, I don't like those. They last about a week and a half and, you know, it's kind of worthless, but... Just as I was thinking about that, that I felt addressed. There were these two words, just two words, learn humility. And I thought, oh, see, that's for me. And uh, so I need to think about this to see if this is from the Lord. And uh, I don't want to just push it aside. And so that was the beginning. And I just started by writing notes in a journal. And I'm not very good at journal writing. I have probably a dozen journals over there on my bookshelves that are half written and, <laughs> and you know, scribbles on it and all. Uh, but I began. That's how I started. And uh, I thought it, it was a while before I realized, oh, this may be something that we need to share a little broader. Uh, but there I felt that kind of contradiction. How do you write on humility, which uh, values, for example, uh, anonymity. Uh, You know, you don't, and if this, you know, comes out, uh, we'll be doing podcasts. Oh my, do I really want to do that? (laughs) All of those I'm really proud of my book on humility, right? Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) I've doubled my humility this year. (laughs) Brenda mentioned <laughs> Brenda mentioned three years. Uh, yeah, the book is cast in a journal form of one year. The actual writing took about three years, and I condensed things finally. But wow. uh, yeah, yeah, that's okay because hmm. I'm I'm much older now. I wrote, write a lot slower. <laughs> I'll get. Uh, uh, there's the old saying that uh, I spent all morning taking out a comma and all afternoon putting it back in. <laughs> that's, uh, that's sometimes what writers do. I'd love for each of you to reflect on humility as it sits in your tradition. So Richard, a Quaker background and tradition. Brenda, you come from charismatical even or charismatic evangelical world, mm-hmm. um, which I think a lot of us are much more familiar with. Um, the pros and the cons, like you have human beings involved in every tradition. It's not like anyone has a monopoly on humility, but how have you seen it? best practiced, and then maybe where are some of us exposed in our traditions? When I think about that question, I I really think about how we're all just human beings. And I think we all Mm -hmm. fall prey to both, you know, the the promises of of living faithfully with God and, and the dangers of following our humanity, following our flesh. I, you know, I think in my tradition, Pentecostal slash charismatic, as well as evangelical, 
Um, there are so many wonderful, beautiful people that are serving and loving the people of this world in so many ways. And I think, unfortunately, what gets broadcast most often are the hypocritical areas of people focusing on certain types of sin and then being found to be in sin themselves in other ways, um, or just having too loud of a voice in certain areas. Um, but so much of that too, I think is just the messages we hear in the world are, we're, we're going to hear the negative messages a lot more than we're going to hear the positives. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I just think we're all human. We're all human. We're all prone to, um, you know, not, not always doing a great balance between grace and truth, you know, living out a great, uh, a, you know, a skewed balance between grace and truth, which is what we want. We want to, we want to follow Jesus way of living in grace and truth. Um, so I think that that challenge is there for all of us, no matter what tradition we're from. Um, you know, may we keep our eyes on him and what, may we speak and act as, as his spirit guides us to do. And that is the challenge of every day. And it's a big enough challenge for all of us. Yeah, I, I would be tempted to say, Richard, as an evangelical, you know, that, oh, okay, uh, yeah, maybe maybe the Quakers have something to teach us on this, but what, what would you have to say? That's from the outside looking in. Believe me, we've seen plenty of uh, arrogance and pride and narcissism and uh, hmm. among Quakers. But I do want to say this, and it helped me from uh, way back my teenage years, uh, there's a saying among Quakers that's often used that we always allow our performance to exceed our profession. That is, that we what we do is always in excess of what we talk about. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that's a that's a that that is a way of tempering. This thing, I mean, it, it really is reflecting Jesus' words. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond that comes from evil. See? So just saying what is actually the case. Mm. You're not trying to embellish it or make it sound better than it really is. I allow what I do to exceed what I say. <laughs> And we could all learn from that, I know. Yeah. Well, and I think social media has made that, and this idea of everybody finding a platform, building a platform, uh, that's even even more needed. But I want to go back to something that you both hinted at. It is sort of ironic. I mean, we're writing about humility in a book, and I don't know too many authors that don't want to sell any copies of their book. I spent three years of my life writing this. I hope it doesn't sell. We, we all hope that the book gets some level of distribution. And then here we are on a podcast, and I'm not the only one you're doing. You're doing many podcasts um, to, quote, promote the book. So, you know, welcome to life as we know it. This is just, this is not a criticism. That's just, we're all in this layer together. How do you navigate talking about humility when you're promoting a book on humility. And that we can just insert our own project here. So how do you navigate that? That's a, that's a wonderful question. And I, and I puzzled over yeah. it. Um, I didn't say anything to anyone except my wife for a long time about this uh, mm -hmm. for that very reason. And, uh, when I the, when I finally mention it to our son, our youngest son, Nathan, <laughs> he just quipped, "Oh, a book on humility that'll make you famous for sure." And now he was it was a joke. <laughs> he was, <laughs> but he also underscored that kind of attention that you have. Uh, I've always loved. There's an old book from the Middle Ages. Uh, 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 Brenda, the author's unknown to us, uh, The Cloud of Unknowing. Oh, and the I Cloud always of Unknowing? Yeah. I got such a kick out of, here's somebody who never, we, we have no idea who wrote this. And I thought, oh man, that's great. But in our day, you are right. 
uh, publishers, for example, mm -hmm. uh, they'll tend uh, to uh, ask first about your platform, not whether you can write yep. well or whether you have anything True. worth saying or writing, <laughs> but do you have a platform? <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of the thing to work with. It's, it just yeah. is there. And, you know, if I had my druthers, I would just walk up into those mountains west of here and, and never be heard from again. I'd be happy with that. But that's not mm -hmm. been the case in my life. And that's, you know, it's kind of, in a sense, the cross that I've had to bear that, uh, you know, it's okay. And I mean, it's not. And I remember there was a writer some time back, Henry Nowen, and when I was with him and uh, mm -hmm. mentioned about this very problem, he said, oh, no, think of the, the uh, getting to be known a bit as a means of giving a platform to other people. And I thought, oh, mm. good for him. So we've worked at that. We've tried to bring folks that really have something, and Brenda's one of them, uh, to give them mm -hmm. a platform in any way we can. Isn't that good? We Certainly all have good. to struggle, though, with this. It's not, it's not an easy thing. But yes. here we are. And we, and we must never do the opposite. I remember... Um, our dear team member, Dallas Willard, he's uh, on in heaven now, but I was, oh, I don't remember, somebody was saying all these nice things and I was, oh, trying to, you know, uh, and Dallas just said, oh, stop this humble mumble. And I thought, oh, he's right. I just need to learn to say thank you. I'm glad mm. that it's been helpful. Mm and not try to deflect all the time. <laughs> so I've learned about the humble mumble. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Richard. Brenda, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're in it every day too. And as a pastor, I'm sure you want to reach new people. You want to see people grow. You want to see uh, your church accomplish its mission. Any thoughts on, on, the inherent tension between getting the word out there and humility? Well, I think it, it goes back again to listening to the voice of the Spirit in your life and doing what He asks you to do, obeying what God asks you to do, mm -hmm. and, you know, making it your constant prayer that, Lord, this is your work and not mine. This is yours, mm -hmm. and I'm surrendered to you, and will you be my voice? Will, you know, will you be my actions? Will you guide my decisions? And will it, will it point people, not at me, but will it point people to you? That's what we want. We want it to point people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if, if we can do that in whatever he asks us to do, whether it's um, being in the public spotlight or whether it's, um, you know, cleaning the toilets at our church, whatever it is, you know, may it point pe people to Jesus. And that's, that's what we're in it for. And we all have to do our part. It's it's the passage about the body that, you know, every part of the body is needed. Everyone is necessary. And there's no one that's more important than the other. Exactly. I've watched this. Uh, I've been to Brenda's church and, oh, my, just her attention to details in people's lives. That's wonderful to watch. <laughs> so it was a three-year journey. Um, what were or were there breakthroughs along the way? Like if you had some aha moments, some key insights, some turning points, Richard, when you went on this journey, what, what were some of those moments that were uh, crystallizing moments for you? It was, for me, it was mainly a very, very slow, dawning, of the importance of humility and that Jesus, that, I mean, all of that, the, the birth, how uh, the life, the teaching, the death, the resurrection, all of this 
reflected a humbleness of spirit. Of course, I read enough and like Greek philosophy and so on to know that humility was not particularly valued in that kind of culture. And it right. was this Christ event that brought us. And, and uh, Augustine was one of the great writers that first helped us to see uh, how humility was so central to a life of uh, a good life, a life of virtue. Mm. See, these are things that bring us into life, not to make us miserable. And we observe to do things that are uh, that are good for us. I mean, you know, the the rules and the counsels in Scripture are to bring us not not to discourage us from, you know, make our lives miserable, but to give us real life. I mean, I could take a this pen I have here. I could take that and you know, jam it into my eye. But I wouldn't, why wouldn't I do that? Well, it isn't, doesn't bring life. <laughs> mm. So I learned to, this, that, that all of this, then that the humility brings us a lot more joy, a lot more fun, a lot more happiness than uh, arrogance. And you just think of what pride does to people and how they have to, you know, work so hard to feel that everybody thinks they're wonderful. <laughs> we need to let go of that. Hmm. Brenda, what was the impact of taking this journey with Richard? What has that been in your life? Well, I just want to in follow up to what Richard just said, I want to just note um, a verse, James 4, verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And, you know, we could live on that verse for a year or more. Um, you know, Richard's talking about living abundant life in Jesus. And how do we do that? It's not by lifting ourselves up. It's by letting him lift us up. And when he, that's what we want, right? We We want to be lifted up by God. And when he lifts us up, it's going to be so different and so much more rich and full than when we try and lift ourselves up in this world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is what I got from this project is that reminder about why I'm in it, why I'm in it with Jesus. Why why am I following him? What What is it that he's called me to? And um, it's been so good to take this journey back in time through many of the devotional masters of of years past and um, through, we haven't talked at all about the Lakota people, but Richard ties in the Lakota people mm. in this book in a big way. And it's really beautiful how that all happened. Richard calls it a divine accident that he integrated the Lakota people with, with this message, but it's really amazing. Um, to learn that their their foundational virtue of that culture is humility, just as well as it is in the Bible, you know, mm -hmm. and, and as it is with many of our devotional masters um, that he talks about. So, taking that journey and just having that impressed upon my heart again that that it's true in Scripture and it's 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 God's way for us, and it's it's the first part of my formation in Christ. You know, Andrew Murray says it's it's the most important part of discipleship is is learning humility. And think about that. That's the most important part of my discipleship to Jesus hmm. is to grow in humility. Um so we all need it. We we need the reminder, we we need the affirmation, we we need the encouragement of one another that we're doing this together. We're committed to this together. We're in it together. We're God's people. And um if we do this, that this has this message has really come, I think, from the Lord to me over these years. That if God's people can follow His way of humility, it opens wide the door for God to act in even greater power and um, purpose in this world. Because the more we are following Him and shaped like Him, the more He has the absolute freedom to do His work in this world, and that's what we want. Mm. Mm. 
Let's talk about your Lakota heritage, uh, oh. Richard, and you did integrate that into the book. So tell us uh, what led to your embrace of that part of your heritage and how it ties into humility and spiritual disciplines. Well, like Brenda said, it uh, it felt like a kind of a divine accident because because I was writing in a journal form, and I I don't know I just didn't wasn't drawn to the idea of using the Latin uh, Gregorian calendar January February March, uh, and so I turned part of my background is not Lakota but Ojibwa. Um, and I looked at the Ojibwa calendar, a number of calendars, but the Lakota calendar really just seemed good. I, I loved its connection to the earth. And anyway, it just seemed like fun. So I started that. And uh, like the moon when the ducks come back. <laughs> I love that. Mm. Love ducks. Here they are. Do they have any purpose in life? I don't know, but there they just seem to enjoy life. But those kinds of things. And uh, then I thought, well, if I'm going to use the Lakota calendar, I should uh, learn a little more. I knew I have maybe, I don't know, a dozen books or so on those kinds of things, but I thought I, I'd like to dip in and learn some more. And so, so I did. Uh, Here's a book, The Lakota Way, and uh, mm. just uh, stories. And this particular book, the writer, uh, Lakota is his first language. So, I mean, he's wonderful at English. This book is in English. But uh, it is based on the 12 Lakota virtues. And I begin to learn <laughs> this and go, oh, wow. And the first virtue of the Lakota uh, list is humility. And I thought, <laughs> I think I could learn a few things here. <laughs> so mm. I would get to do that. And, and of course, Lakota is a, is an oral tradition. And so storytelling is the way that they would convey, uh, teaching and meaning. And so they're wonderful storytellers. And, uh, I love many of those Lakota stories. I I mention a few of them in what I wrote, um, but there are many others, and it's great fun to learn uh, from another tradition. You know, God is is wonderful at spreading His truth around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he is. You mentioned three leaders that I have so much respect for and was sad when each of them died. Years ago, Henry Nowen, when he passed, and more recently, Dallas Willard and Eugene yes. Peterson. And I remember experiencing all three as real losses. You know, like these are these are, are spiritual giants of our time who are yes. no longer with us. And you knew them all. What what were some of the qualities and characteristics of Henry, Eugene, and Dallas that you think it would be really good for young leaders to pay attention to? Yeah. You know, I, I have to say that the humility of life, I mean, mm. Dallas was a genius. Um, yeah. Uh, and just to see him... When I, the first church, he was in that church, he and his wife, Jane, and their two kids, John and Becky. When I went there, the first thing I noticed was Dallas with one other fellow, Tony Dorenzo. Tony uh, was a construction worker, really hard worker, had a third grade yeah. education. And so he could not follow. Dallas was a professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California. And a brilliant phenomenology was his field. But Tony could never have understood any of that stuff. But the two of them would meet once a week to study the Bible, met in Dallas's home. And I watched this, and I watched the love 
that Tony had for Dallas. And I thought, oh, my, this is something marvelous. And I want to learn from it. Mm. One time when Dallas and Jane were going through a difficult time, Tony calls me, we need to fast and pray for Dallas, Jane. And uh, he called the meeting <laughs> together. He, I mean, I, you know, as the pastor, but here was Tony, three or four days straight fasting, and he worked hard construction. And uh, mm-hmm. I was just astonished at that. Uh, and and Henry Nowen, his uh, the first time we met, that we were being interviewed by a journal and. And after that interview, we were in the Chicago airport, and he took me aside, and he said, he said, I didn't come for this interview. I came to meet you. Hmm. He? I mean, you know, who was I? And uh, we sat, and I was with him, oh, three times, I think. What a kind, kind man. Hmm. And... He struggled on plenty of things. Yeah. And Eugene, I, I formed about 30 years ago a little group of writers. And Eugene and Jan were part of that group. Uh, his wonderful uh, work with the uh, Bible, the message that he, he, um, he read that to us in the, from the early days. And he, he started with the Psalms. And our group, many of these are writers, many of them poets and different things. I mean, they were astonished, but I had, you know, some background in Hebrew, and I saw what he was doing. And uh, later, <laughs> one of our members asked um, Eugene, well, what English translation do you use? And Eugene just kind of put his head down. He didn't use any English translation. He just used Hebrew and Greek. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Whole nother level. Oh, yeah, right. That's another level. <laughs> so they just, <laughs> and, and they were all fun. Just mm. fun. I, let me just tell you this brief story. Uh, it was a little Please. men's group that I was, that this little church. And Dallas was part of this group. There probably were maybe a dozen of us. And one fellow, he's dead now, but so I can tell the story. He was kind of rough as a cob. He just, I don't know. But uh, Jim came one time and he, he was just telling the story that he had, I don't know, got a hold of some peppers, habanero peppers. Was that really hot peppers? Yeah. And he, he and this yeah. was... This was Jim. He took uh, several of them and just stuffed them in his mouth. And uh, he was just telling the group, and and uh, he said they were so hot, you know, and uh, they'd burn the hell out of you. And Dallas was sitting by him and just leaned over and said, give me a thousand of them. <laughs> and that was that was Dallas. <laughs> um, you know, Richard, I've noticed you're laughing a lot in this conversation. <laughs> it sounds like you found a level of joy that yes, I think well, eludes a lot of people. That's one of the wonderful things when you read some of the great devotional masters. They were funny. I mean, mm-hmm. St. Francis, troubadour of the Lord, just, you know, hmm. and, and uh, I, there, there, I'll tell this quick story. A dear lady uh, was uh, 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 helping another lady, Agnes Sanford, who was a speaker and so on, and uh, Margaret was uh, kind of cared for her and so on. So when Agnes died, I wondered how Margaret was doing, and I went to see her. Uh, a little bit later, and she was making one of those, Brenda, what is it that spells out things? Uh, cross stitch. Cross stitch. And I said, Margaret, what, what, where did you get that? Oh, she said, I was, 
praying a few days ago, and the Lord spoke to me, and she was writing out what she thought God had said to her, and this is what she spelled out. Fun ahead, saith the Lord. And she used the old English, saith. And for her, it was this, there's a future for you. You know, there's something to do. Fun ahead, Mm. saith the Lord. And I always have held that. I thought, oh, good for you. (laughs) So I love that. Fun ahead, saith the Lord. You know, just a just a note to listeners or, or leaders, particularly young leaders. I don't know whether either of you have read uh, Henry Nowen. I think it was his first book, The Genesee Diaries, very much a similar format to what you've done with Learning Humility. But he, it was just six months in, um, I'm going to say, was it Benedictine? No, it was something else. Monastery in upstate New York. Was it Benedictine? Monastery in upstate New York. And it was the young, ambitious, academically rising Henry Nowen being broken by God over six months into the Henry Nowen we would come to know and love. And it's probably the book I've gifted most often to other leaders. But if you're looking at that, that you know, journey from type A leader, Richard, triple A, <laughs> to contemplative life, it is such a, a beautiful simple diary on like, you know, he's angry at the other brothers for putting too many raisins in the bread one day and for not taking the stones out of the river the next. And then he's contemplating his own soul and the future of eternity. And it's just this beautiful mixture of very earthy observations and the deepest questions you can ask in life. There's one story. I don't remember whether you might know whether it was in the book or whether he just told me the story, but the uh, abbot came to him with a, there was a little high school group, probably Catholic high school, mm-hmm. that wanted him to speak. And the abbot was, uh, you know, presented it to him. And, and Henry, oh, no, 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 that's what I came here to get away from. Why? And, and he said, besides, I don't have time to prepare. And he says, this is the way Henry told it to me. Uh, the abbot says, prepare. Prepare! What's there to prepare? You've been, you know, teaching for 10 years. You don't need to prepare. Besides, these students, what you teach is not what they're after. They want your presence. If you'll just be present Mm. to them, that's enough. That was Henry, Mm. able to be present to people. Yeah. (laughs) So if people listening, perhaps myself included, want to take a step or two toward humility, I know it's a long obedience in the same direction, to quote (laughs) Eugene, who I think was quoting Kierkegaard. Um, Are are there practical changes? I mean, you've given some good tips along the way, but Brent and Richard, are there some practical things they could really put on their radar screen or in their, their, their prayer life that would help them take a step in the right direction? Well, we talk about this a lot. I think um, praying, you know, committing yourself in prayer to God, and none of us are capable of shaping ourselves. It's it's, it's God who shapes us. And so I think committing mm-hmm. it to Him in prayer is the first step. And then I think, and Richard talks about this a lot in the book, it's um, it's being able to see ourselves for who we are and be honest about who we are, but then it's getting our our eyes off of ourselves and and onto Jesus. And I think it's a daily eyes off of myself and onto Jesus. Um, and it's a walk. Mm-hmm. It's a walk with Him and not being so concerned about humility as we are about just focusing on Him and doing what He asks me to do, not what the world is telling me to do and not what my human nature is telling me to do. It, you know, it's learning to hear His voice and follow His voice apart from the voices of the world and the voices of my own flesh. That's a, that's a daily, you know, that's, that's, that's the Christian walk pretty much in a nutshell. And I think it's hmm. being recommitted to that. Brenda, that's very good. Um, I would encourage people not to be too concerned about humility, but Learn to be concerned about people, persons. Find someone that you could get to know. Learn what they 
care about. I was just, this is one of our grandkids. Uh, I was just talking with him. I, we went out to lunch and I said, uh, he's a, he's a musician and boy, his skills and his knowledge. I mean, this is a 17 year old kid. I said, maybe you could teach me about music. And oh, he brightened up. Oh yeah. And he just, in our few minutes, he goes from the 60s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s and on. And uh, he just knows all these musical genres. And uh, and I said, okay, we're going to get together when you have your guitar there and you teach me. And uh, I just, I, I told Carolyn, I found something that Kyron can really, you know, brighten up to. So. I'm going to go meet with him and let him teach me. See, you just see people and mm-hmm. value people. That will lead you into humility. It, it's not hard. Hmm. This has been a really special conversation. I want to thank you both for it, Brenda and Richard. I appreciate it. The book is called Learning Humility. It's your latest, A Year of Searching for a vanishing future. Any final thoughts as we wrap up? Enjoy. Enjoy the life. Walk cheerfully over the earth. And uh, God will be with you. <laughs> we just, we bless everyone in your audience and we just um, speak the love and the grace and the blessing of Jesus over you. And um, he's, He's brought you here for a reason um, to this podcast, and we just bless all that he's doing in, in and through you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie.